things of the week. So my plan is to give you the, the gist of uh, what we've been doing, what our aim is, and show you some examples. And uh, when we all get exhausted, uh, I'll quit. So, so the first idea is this idea that about children that, for instance, when they have difficulty with something, sometimes people say they're not talented in this direction. Um, so for instance, in the United States, uh, children in the sixth and seventh grade who start taking foreign language have difficulty with it. And I understand that there's some difficulty with Japanese children learning English. But we know that if we took these children and just put the American child in Japan or the Japanese child in America, then they would learn the other languages without any difficulty at all. Because the problem wasn't that they weren't talented at language, they weren't in an environment that made sense. So we can ask questions about lots of different areas. For instance, what about music? Well, in fact, one of my heroes, Professor Suzuki, showed that children, whether they appear to have musical talent or not, can learn an enormous amount about music and to make music by simply creating a musical environment. What about mathematics? This is one place where, in America, children, some children are thought not to be mathematically minded, maybe in Japan also, but, sorry. But Seymour Papert showed that you could make a math land with logo, a place where even very complex mathematical subjects like differential geometry, which are not even usually studied by high school uh, children, can be learned by young children very easily. For instance, a young child of six or seven uh, can learn how to make a circle in a highly mathematical fashion using differential geometry with this simple little program, forward a little turn a little over and over again. This form of mathematics is actually the form of mathematics that is used in science, uh, but is not learned by most children uh, anywhere in the world. This is an interesting example of something that children are actually quite good at, but uh, nobody realizes it and uh, they're not taught. And our uh, research many years ago, more than 30 years ago, got started because I met Seymour Papert. I thought his basic idea of making an environment in which a subject was meaningful uh, was incredibly important. Uh, we extended this to asking the question, well, what about ideas? Are children idea-minded? And our thought was, that someday every child will have a Dynabook computer that is an artistic tool for them, which they can learn many things. And as an analogy to musical instruments, you can think of it as the a musical instrument whose music is ideas. So the important idea is for children, a room like this is not math land. A room like this is not ideal land. So, a room like this is more like prison land. <laughs> so another idea is that when we work with children, we have to understand the mind of the child, and we have to love the mind of the child in order to help the mind of the child. So Piaget and others pointed out that children are not broken adults that have to be fixed. So schooling is not about fixing children. 
It's about helping them grow. So we work with many thousands of children over the last more than 30 years now and have had some experience with many ages of children. Uh, our contributions to personal computing were largely made uh, to create uh, environments for children uh, where they can learn. But here's another idea. This is something every musician knows, that the music is not in the piano. And the ideas aren't in the computer. So when we, well, go ahead and say it. <laughs> so it's a very important idea. You shouldn't expect much if you put a piano in a classroom. <laughs> you shouldn't expect much if you put a piano in a classroom. And you shouldn't expect much if you just put a computer in a classroom. So a piano is an amplifier for musical impulse. A computer can amplify our idea. But somehow, we have to have those ideas and impulses. So here's a, an analogy to thinking that McLuhan thought of. He said, I, didn't, I don't know who invented water, but it wasn't a fish. And he meant, we are the fish, and the water that we can't see are all of our beliefs that are invisible to us. Yeah, so the, a fish can't see the, the water that it's in, and we can't see our own beliefs. So most of what's important about what people do and how to help change happen are completely invisible. Most of what's important is completely invisible. So here's another way of looking at, at uh, this. We take the pink water in the goldfish bowl and flatten it out. So we can think of all the conventional things we do as being like an ant crawling around this pink plant. We can have the illusion of great freedom and originality. So we can pick directions. We can get around the obstacles. We can choose goals, but looking at it from the outside, everything we're doing is pink. Most schooling in most societies is to help children become pink. Right? Education actually has very little about to do about becoming pink. So you think of this, this process here as being more like training. So every once in a while, the ant crawling along the pink plane might have a little outlaw idea, a little blue idea. But <laughs> the ant goes to church, the ant has parents, the ant goes to university. Now, it's a, this is good, actually, up to a point, because most ideas are bad. So it's good to be have a little bit of a splat in there. But Every once in a while, when the ant is not thinking about church or university or parents, the ant gets a fully blue idea. So this is what education is about. Education is being about being able to take perspectives outside of your beliefs. So education is essentially creative. It's about new combinations inside your mind. And there are emotional reactions when you have one of these blue ideas. Uh, if it's about a joke, then it's laughter. <laughs> if somebody's telling you a joke, a joke is being led along a pink conventional idea and then suddenly being revealed as it's about something else. So you get laughter. Okay. Um, if it's science, then often there is an aha. Sometimes laughter. And the reason science is often funny 
is because the universe didn't change just because we discovered something new. The universe has been the way it is for 15 billion years. So what's funny about science is that we couldn't see what was right in front of our faces. So we couldn't. What's funny about science is we can't see what's right in front of us because we can only see pink. Then art has this ah, long, drawn out ah, because it's one of the main purposes of art to reveal to us different ways of looking at things. To say to us, no matter how we think we're looking at the world, there are other ways to look at the world. And the connection of creativity to education and ideas is that it takes almost as much creativity to understand an idea that's not pink as it is to think it up in the first place. <laughs> It takes almost as much effort to understand a new idea as it did to pick it up in the first place. So, when we're trying to make education happen, we're trying for a kind of balance. We're not trying to create total outlaws out of our children, but we don't want to create robots out of them either. And so what we'd like to do is to give the children the discretion, to give them the ability to choose when to be conventional and when not to be conventional. Okay. Now, another idea that I think is truly important, especially when we're dealing with young children, is that most adults and most teachers have no idea just how much ability young children can have. We have a little bit of a sense from uh, children learning music that in the right environment, children can learn far more music uh, than is almost believable. Now here's an example from mathematics that I was very privileged to uh, see about 15 years ago. This is a first grade classroom the teacher's name, Julia Dishajima, yes. in Los Angeles. And this, these are first graders, and this is about March in the school year. So September, October, November, December, January, March. About five months into the school year for these first graders. Now the important thing about this teacher is that she is a natural mathematician. Somewhat like a jazz musician who was perhaps not trained in a conservatory, but is an incredible musician, nonetheless. So a first grade teacher who is a real mathematical thinker. So her challenge to her first graders here is to take tiles of different shapes and make the next larger collection of tiles that has the same shape as the tile they started with. So here's the next larger diamond and the next larger diamond. You see the trapezoids are really complicated. So you have to turn the tiles around. So the, all the kids in the class take some set of shapes and work them out as you can see here. And then after they do that, then she has them look at what they've done and write it down on a sheet of paper. So the first one they did required one tile and had one total tile. The second one they did required three more tiles and had four total tiles in it. The next one required five more tiles and had nine total tiles. So they wrote down all of these numbers. Then after they did this, they brought them all together and compared them. They found that every single one of these shapes growing and preserving the same shape had exactly the same rule. Now the mathematicians in the room will recognize this as a second order differential equation. And what the kids found out was a general rule about several things, including how to generate the square numbers 
but more importantly, uh, what mathematicians would call an invariant for growing shapes. Okay. Now, most parents would have no idea what their children did. And most elementary school teachers would have no idea about what these children did. And most school principals would have no idea about what these children did. And most school board members, most politicians, maybe even most heads of government, would have no idea about what these children did. The reason is that these children did real mathematics. And almost no child in America is ever taught real mathematics. So almost none of the adults understand real mathematics either. So if you want to teach children real mathematics, there's a real problem. Because no, almost no adult that you can talk to understands what it is. Almost no teacher understands it. So basically in America, and I think this is true in Japan as well, what is called mathematics is actually calculation. The children are taught to recognize patterns and then apply rules to those patterns. But mathematics is not about recognizing patterns and applying rules. It's about understanding relationships. So when I saw this 15 years ago, I was shocked myself, even though I am a mathematician, because I had no idea that a six-year-old child could do this. I just assumed it was something that would only a few children could learn, and they could only learn it 10 years later in their lives. So the people who have studied this now realize that children, especially very young children, are very, very able to understand complex mathematical relationships if they're put into an environment where math makes sense to them. So the, the basic idea here is it's not so much, I'm going to show you some computer stuff now, but don't get frozen by the computer stuff. The computer is just making an environment where math has meaning. The math, uh, using the computer to make an environment where mathematics has meaning. So, now here's another difficulty. <coughs> Since, especially in the elementary school area in the U.S., almost nobody involved, whether they're teachers, parents, school board members, principals, people who make standards, people who make textbooks, um, and politicians, since almost none of them understand anything about mathematics and how it's used, it is extremely difficult to make any changes. So the kind of math that, kind of stuff that's called mathematics has numbers in the form of numerals, has algebraic equations, uh, analytic geometry, trigonometry, and so forth. And this is what everybody learns. Now, it happens if you're going to get interested in science, you start learning what Galileo called the language of science, which is mathematics, you're in for a shock. You're, you're basically in for a shock if you then want to start studying science having learned conventional math. Because what you discover is almost nothing that you learned in K through 12 helps. In fact, science did away with most of this stuff about 100 years ago. It's too hard. And what got invented, starting really about 150 years ago, were a different way of thinking about numbers called vectors, a different way of thinking about coordinate systems, which is not to have coordinate systems, different ways of transforming relationships, called differential models and tensors. So here's, here's the important thing. I think there are two important ideas here. First, science uses ideas like this 
and they're easier for children to learn. So why don't we just teach them these much more powerful ideas instead of these difficult and less powerful ideas. And in fact, from the children's standpoint, they can learn these ideas through play. So if you ask a musician, what are you doing? They say, I'm playing. If you ask a tennis player, what are you doing? They say, well, I'm playing. I'm a mathematician. If you ask me what I'm doing, I'll say, I'm playing. If you ask a scientist what they're doing, they'll say, I'm playing. Now, one of the reasons we have a hard time uh, getting kids to be mathematicians and scientists in the United States is we let them play in kindergarten, and then we don't let them play for 12 or 16 years of regular school. So after 16 years of no play, we then suddenly start asking them to play again when they get into graduate school. So this just doesn't work. This is why what you said in your talk, I think, is really important. So the kind of fun we like children to have is what we call hard fun. Hard fun is like learning to play a musical instrument instead of just listening to music, learning to hit a baseball instead of just watching it on television, and actually doing real math and real science instead of learning about it. So a kind of first project that children often do is to make a little car that they can learn how to drive. And so they just draw the car. I always draw the same car. This is a very typical kind of car that children draw. So the important part of this is that always want to start off with something that the children think of as play. And once they start playing, you can make things as hard as you want and they'll keep on going with you. So I painted a little car here, and it's a graphic object that I can do things with. So this is a hand-eye world over here, and I can look inside of it to see the mathematics of this little car. So for instance, here's where the car is pointing, called the car's heading. So I'll click on this number over here, and as it counts up, you can see the car turning. Keep your eye right here, and Watch what happens when I turn it by hand. So hand-eye over here and symbolic over here. Here's a behavior, forward. So I'm clicking on this forward guy and he's going forward. Here's a, another behavior, turn, clicking on it and he's turning. So if I want to make a little script, I can just pull out the tiles here. So car forward by five, car turn by five. I'll click on the clock here. So now I've actually uh, I've got this going on in a circle. I can come over here and I can uh, put the pen down underneath this car. I can experiment with steering this car. So zero goes straight, negative goes in the other direction. So for the mathematicians in the crowd, this is an integrator and I'm changing the radius of curvature of these curves that this car is tracing out. Okay, but we really want to steer our car with a steering wheel, so I'll just draw a steering wheel here. And this steering wheel is the same kind of object as the car is. I'll call this wheel. Wheel has a heading. See this number zero here? go positive and negative as I turn the wheel. And if you remember, the car went in different directions depending on this number down here. So what do you suppose would happen if I take the name of the numbers coming out of the wheel and drop it into the script here? So the child has achieved a car that's drivable, but has learned in one step what a variable is, and that child will never forget it for the rest of their life from just one instance of learning. And this is because of the environmental nature of this learning. The learning is what psychologists call situated. It's called, the learning is called situated. It means, it means it's in a situation. It's not without, it's not with zero context. It has context. Now it happens that the, 
a little bit hard to control this car, and the child might want to have some help. And suppose the child's teacher at this point doesn't quite know what to do, or the child's parent at this point doesn't quite know what to do. Then what we want to do is we want to find a mentor out on the internet. So here's a child, Tommy, in Germany. And here's Tommy in Germany. Here's Sam, let's say, in Japan. So we can chat with Tommy. And over the internet it goes, and so Tommy can chat back. Now, as soon as they start going, they actually start talking to each other, because we have voice chat. Yeah, this is difficult to do with two machines. So I'll just give you a sense of the kind of things that they say to each other. So Sam complains that he can't control his car. And Tommy's advice is to share his desktop so Tommy can see what he's doing in Germany. So Sam uh, says share down here. And that allows Tommy over here in Germany to say, OK, I want to look and see what Sam is doing. And over the internet goes. And now when Tommy joins here, we can see that both Tommy and Sam are in both of these spaces. So Tommy can come over here and say, OK, why don't I see what your problem is. In order to fix this, why don't you try uh, dividing the number coming out of the steering wheel by, say, something like 3. And then uh, Sam can try this, and all of a sudden we see that it's much more controllable. And all of a sudden, Sam understands for the first time what division is good for. And usually what happens after the children do something like this, some useful information is passed, and then they decide to play a game. And so Tom, one of the things that Tommy might do is to take this car that he did last year and just drop it on the shared space like that. And his car was running when it got sent, so it shows up in the shared space there. And both the kids can interact with the simultaneously. And all the media that is in a system like this can be uh, shared this way. So, for instance, if we move from this to a um, piece of desktop publishing, it gets transmitted over the network, and Tommy in Germany can pick up the uh, a picture here and grab onto it. Okay, so this is a key part of this idea, is that we think, in general, um, children are going to be much more likely to be able to help other children than uh, we'll be able to train lots of adults over the next few years. So the combination here is new curriculum ideas that have been tested for quite a number of years, plus mentoring by children who have already done this curriculum all over the world. Okay, I think, I think we're almost done, actually. Um, I have many examples here, but I think I want to show you um, just one. I'll give you a little glimpse into the, the system has unlimited numbers of desktops. So I don't have to have anything like PowerPoint to give a presentation. I'll just link these desktops together. And uh, what I'm going to skip to here is uh, first to show you uh, what our friend Hideki Mori here at nearby uh, Camp Project did. So I'll let you just play this. We hold workshops with MIT, National Geographic Society, LEGO, people from children's museums and science museums around the world. Doctor. Oh, yeah, maybe, I'll, no, maybe I'll just play it. I'll just play it. Alan K. and the Sweet Project. Alan K. and the Sweet Project.
Today is the first time we've done a sweet workshop here at camp. I think the children made an amazing variety of discoveries. Especially memorable was a girl who made an animation of an animal which chases after two other animals. I always think during a workshop that it's better not to have someone teach the children, but to have the children discover things and ideas among themselves. That's the really powerful thing. The children who came today are certainly learning science in school, or are supposed to be learning it. But now they've actually experienced it this week as well, but without realizing it. Okay, I'd like to show you a little science to finish this off. I'd like to introduce uh, Kim Rose. Kim Rose is the cognitive scientist who uh, helps design our experiments in the classroom. So this, uh, what I'm going to show you to end the, this talk is a very unusual project that I originally designed for ninth graders or even high schoolers. And our fifth grade teacher that we've been working with uh, saw it and wanted to try it out on our fifth graders. And the subject matter is a famous one in the U.S. because most college students never, have, it's been shown that most college students who learn this in the U.S. never really understand it. So it's what actually happens in a scientific sense when you drop something. And the objects that you think will fall to the earth at the same time. Okay, do not pay any attention to what anybody else is doing. Which was 
help me figure out if the size was just right. After I'd done that, I would go and click on the little basic category button, and then a little menu would pop up, and one of the categories would be geometry, so I'd click on that. And here it has many things that have to do with the size and shape of the rectangle. So I would see what the height is. I kept going along the process until I had them all lined up with their height. I subtracted the smaller one's height from the big one to see if there was a kind of pattern anywhere that could help me out in my business work. So in order to show that it was working, I decided to move a top copy so that it would show that the ball was going to be exactly like the acceleration. So he dropped little drops down to show that he had exactly the right relationship to match up with the, the frames of the movie. I'm going to do this a little bit uh, differently here. Um, what I'm going to do is run the ball and the movie at the same time at a slow rate so you can see what... Okay, so the simulated ball is doing what the real ball did because it's obeying the differential equation that nature has set up. That's how real children do real math and real science. So I believe that the traditional approach to doing, dealing with knowledge like this is very, very far away from children's experience, whether they're 10 years old or whether they're 20 years old. This approach to doing science, nature shows you what it's doing and the scripting acts the part of the mathematics to allow you, the child, to create a simulation of the physical phenomenon. So this is a good place to, to quit. I want to thank the city of Kyoto, Kyoto University, my friend, Professor Kobayashi, who has found many ways of tiring us out, and we're really glad he has. I uh, thank all of you, and I believe that we're going to have a lot of fun doing this project over the next uh, couple of years. Thank you very much. satisfied with it uh, for 20 years, but the last several years uh, it's gotten to a state where we think it's good enough to uh, spread uh, outside of our own research. But I should say, I think one important thing that um, we started thinking about very seriously about 15 years ago was you know, why? Why do children do things? Why will children, for some play, put enormous number of hours and energy and effort in, like video games, say? And for other areas, uh, they don't try at all. And I think one of the most important things is that every environment is 
at the end is an individual, individual environment for an individual child. So for example, I'm, this stuff, some children learn it because they're interested in the ideas. Some, good. some children learn it because they're interested in the ideas. Some children learn it because it's part of their theatrical play of themselves as a hero. Some children learn it because they have social relationships with other children who are interested in it. So a good learning environment isn't just one thing. But it has to, the children have to be able to see their own faces in the learning environment. Other questions? MTT データの子会関西 MTT データとしてたぶん一番面白いんですけども、あのー、今日の,あの先生の、まあ、もちろんこの実験というのは素晴らしいことで、非常にこれからも推進していただきたいと思います。ただ、あのー、実は日本ではですね、昭和20年代に、あの生活探検教育という形で,です、ね、あの教科の枠を超えた実験をやったことがあって、見事に失敗してしまったという、まあ、経験があるんですけれども、ぜひあのこういう教科の枠を超えたこういういろんな教育において、現場の教師のトレーニングですね、学校の先生とのトレーニングとか、その調和についてですね、どのような実績があるのか、どのような、まあ、今までの経験とか、そういうアイデアとかありましたらぜひお願いします。Teaching the teachers is the hardest part of this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't mean it see, because the teachers that we work with are tremendously hard working. They're very busy, they're very dedicated. And to ask them to learn mathematics after 40 years of not doing it is like asking somebody to learn a new language. In their 40s, or learning a, to play a classical musical instrument in their 40s. So the the problem is not that the teachers are incompetent or anything like that. The problem is the teachers uh, don't have the time. It's hard to, the, for instance, the educational system in the U.S. will not pay the teachers to learn. So the teachers can't learn a little bit each day. They have to wait until the summer. And that's not the best way for them to learn this stuff. So the, I believe one of the biggest problems is what we call helping the helpers instead of teaching the teachers. Because there are many kinds of adults who are trying to help children. Okay, so, uh, but the mentoring is a way of bridging some of that gap. Because many questions that, yeah, so many, let me see if I can summarize it. So, to bridge the gap of helping the helpers, we think the mentoring will deal with many questions that children will have. So it's a little bit like open source software. But the children who have already done it and want to be mentors will be available around the world uh, in order to answer other children's questions. And they like to do this. And That's not a complete substitute for retraining the teachers, but in fact, it's been impossible to retrain teachers successfully for 40 years or more. So this is a very difficult problem to deal with, both in the U.S. and in Japan. It's just a problem. でやはりあのすでにあった人が助けるということでは、それからすでにいろんなことをできる人をが、まあ、世界中からネットワークでメンターと言われましたが、そういう人たちに助けてもらうというのがいいだろうということで、まあ、局であるにもそういうあの日本人のメンターのネットワークをちゃんと作るというようなことをやっていますというようなことになっています。<笑><笑><笑>